Well, good morning. Good morning. Come on in and grab a seat if you're able. Welcome to Placerita Bible Church. It's great to have you with us today on this special resurrection morn. And so if you're visiting this morning, we want to welcome you by just saying we're thankful that you're here. Make sure you stop by our welcome table before you leave this morning. There's some information about our church we'd love to give you and just want to get to know you a little bit. And we'd love to serve you in any way that we can. And uh, we're just thankful that you're here. This is a special day, the, the, the day of the resurrection. And the history of the church uh, likes to say something, so I want you to re- respond to my statement, which is simply this, he is risen. Amen. So we are excited this morning, as we are every Lord's Day, to worship our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So thanks for being with us. Hope that you'll enjoy our service. We have some special music and and singing and worship, a special message, but we're going to start off with reading about the resurrection. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, let me invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. If you were here with us on the Good Friday service, we read up to this point, saving this passage, obviously, for this morning. So if you're able to stand with me in honor of God's word, let's look at Matthew chapter 28 together as we kick off our service this morning. Here's what we read at the end of the glorious gospel account according to Matthew. He writes, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, and he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there will they see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. You may be seated. Father, we're grateful this morning to be able to reflect on this incredible chapter, this chapter of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're grateful this morning that Jesus came and that he gave his life as a ransom for many and that he was crucified on the cross. And we studied about the day that Jesus died, how there was darkness over the whole earth from noon until 3 p.m., that Jesus breathed and gave up his spirit. Yet we know that according to the scripture, according to what happened in the first century on this very occasion, that on the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead. And as we read about this passage this morning, I pray that it would just encourage us and embolden us 
Just as there was a a great earthquake and the angel of the Lord descended to make this announcement to the women coming to the tomb this morning, I pray that it would be just as earth shattering in our own hearts this morning, just as life changing for us today, this morning, to realize that he is risen and then that we would take to heart what was then commanded, that we would go and tell, that we would go and tell our friends and our co-workers and our neighbors and our family and all those that we come in contact with today and throughout this week and throughout our lives, that we would go and tell others about the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would cause us to have great joy and great purpose and great meaning to our life, knowing that we've been rescued from our own sin and that we've been given eternal life for those who would repent and believe by faith in the resurrection, that we would have life and life eternal. And so God, we do wanna pray for the world that we live in today as we consider the bad news that's out there that we received in the, through, through the various news agencies. We know that the good news this morning is that Jesus Christ has conquered the grave. And so we wanna pray for our missionaries this morning. We lift up each and every couple, every individual, every family that's serving you from our church across the world. And we pray that you would give them encouragement today, that you would give them life in your name today, and that you would give them great joy today, and they would know that their labor in the Lord is not in vain. God, we want to pray for our country today. We left up America to you. We pray for all of our elected officials. Pray that you would give them wisdom and grace. We pray that we would be faithful to pray for them day in and day out. And we pray, God, that you would raise up your church here in our nation, across this great land, and here in our own valley. We pray for all of the churches this morning that are preaching the gospel, that you would fill them, and that you would fill them with your truth, and with your grace, and with the blessings that you bestow upon us in the person of Jesus Christ. We pray this morning, as we continue to sing uh, this morning, God, that you would be glorified in the praises of your people right here. God, I pray that you would stir us deeply in our hearts and that we would express incredible gratitude and praise through song as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so be glorified in our time of worship and fellowship this morning as it's all centered around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family and friends. Let's stand together, lifting our voices, singing praises to our Lord and Jesus, singing, Come, people of the risen King.
Well, he is alive, amen? One of the best things to do on Easter is to share that with someone else. And so we're going to take a couple of minutes. We've got a lot of visitors here today and family. So I want you to take a couple of minutes, stand up. I want you to greet those around you and tell them he's alive. Go ahead. Come on, Plasterita. Get up and greet one another. All right. Okay. All right. Very good. Way to go, church. I appreciate that. I love sharing together the fellowship of Christ. The news is so good this morning that you can't keep it to yourself, right? The, good, the news is so good, you just can't keep it to yourself. So thanks for visiting for one another. Thanks again for being with us. If you do have a Bible with you this morning, let me encourage you to open up to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter 6. And you say, well, what's that got to do with the resurrection? And I'm saying everything. So hang with me here in Genesis chapter 6 this morning for our resurrection message. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 8. And the title for the sermon this morning is, God takes your sin personal. God takes your sin personal. We're in Genesis chapter 6. Hopefully that's an easy book for you to find there at the beginning of your Bible. And we're going to be looking at verses 5 through eight together this morning. Here's what Moses, the author of the Pentateuch in the book of Genesis wrote. Genesis chapter six, starting in verse five, he writes this. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God, we bow our heads and our hearts before you this morning, and we thank you for the joy of coming together into this place to sing songs and to read your word and to be pointed to the truth that Jesus is alive. We pray that as we began this morning from the book of Genesis that you would help us to see some important truths about the human race and about our own hearts and that we would be able to more gladly or more deeply appreciate the deliverance that you give us through Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Well, there was a little boy who was attending an Easter service when he began to feel sick. He tapped his mother on the shoulder and he said, Mommy, can we go home now? No, she replied abruptly. The boy waited a minute and tapped her on the shoulder again. I'm feeling sick and I think I'm going to throw up, he whispered. His mom looked at him and noticed he did look a little pale. Okay, go out the front door of the church and go across the parking lot and throw up behind the bushes, she instructed him. Less than a minute later, the boy came back in and sat down in his seat. His mother whispered, did you throw up? The boy nodded his head. But how could you have gone all the way across the parking lot, thrown up and walked back here so quickly, she asked. I didn't even have to leave the church, the boy replied. I found a box at the front of the church doors which said, for the sick. (laughs) Oh, man. 
We all have problems that we need to deal with at times, right? And sometimes we are expedient in how to take care of those issues. And we're really all working through things which can present obstacles to our health and to our happiness. I read an article this week that talked about problems that we have in the first world. These are particular problems we have as a first world country, meaning that we've, we're fully developed and somewhat uh, technologically advanced and have food available to us, unlike in the third world. But here's a list of 10 common problems in the first world. See if you can relate. Number one, I forgot this was live TV. Now I can't fast forward through commercials and I'm so bored. Number two, the ever flowing tap water doesn't taste good enough. Now I'll have to drive to the convenience store and buy some bottled water. Number three, I'm, going, I'm moving and I've decided to donate all my stuff to the trash rather than to a good cause because it would take me about three trips to go to Goodwill. You know you've done that before, all right? Uh, number four, my walk-in closet is not big enough. I need a lot more room to store my stylish wardrobe. And somebody, please, Get me some more hangers. I want food from the back of the fridge, but I'm too lazy to get it because it's blocked by all that food in the front of my fridge. I can't get the right song to stream for my mood right now from my 100,000 song library. Number seven, I had to turn down the brightness of my smartphone because it was hurting my eyes. Number eight, I can't sit comfortably because my wallet is too fat with all the bills. I should really deposit some of that money into my bank account. Number nine, it can be so hard at times to try and, to, to try and decide which soda to refill at the drink machine. Number 10, doggone it, that's the third time I've burned my tongue on my caramel macchiato this week. <laughs> all right, just a few problems that we all have to deal with in the first world. But on a more serious note, what are some of your real problems today? What would you say is your biggest problem that you're dealing with right now? Are you struggling with maybe your finances? Do you have a significant health concern? Are you strained by a broken relationship that you're dealing with? I think many of us would be quick to point out that our world is filled with problems. I mean, there are a lot of things that are not going very well in our world today. There's the war between Russia and Ukraine. There is the war between Hamas and Israel. There is the battle against abortion and easy access to taking a pill that would easily terminate a viable pregnancy. There's all kinds of issues with the LGBTQ plus agenda. There's problems with our economy and problems with our healthcare system and problems with public school education and problems with immigration and problems with identity theft and problems within our political system of our great democracy. But what if I told you this morning that the biggest problem in your life this morning is in you, that you are your own worst enemy. What if I told you that the biggest problem this morning is not outside of you, but it is in your own heart, and you carry this problem around, and it affects all areas of your life. It even affects your relationship with God. My question is, what does God think about all of these problems, and what is he going to do about it? The biggest problem in the world today is sin. And we should be asking, what does God think about this? And how does he respond to all of the evil and the wickedness going on in the world and in my own heart? And so this morning, I want us to look at four headings from Genesis 6, where I think we find answers to these questions that will help us see the problem and then see God's solution to that problem. And our outline this morning is simple. God sees, God grieves, God judges, and God delivers. But let's start with number one this morning, God sees. And if you are taking notes this morning, that first blank says, the omnipotence 
of God, the omnipotence of God. Look at verse five. It says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, I don't know about you this morning, but I'm not sure I'm the only one here that sometimes feels like God is the only one who sees everything, but so does Google. I mean, we could be having a conversation in our house and all of a sudden Alexa turns on and tries to get involved in our conversation and we're not even talking to her. (laughs) Or maybe we're just discussing where we want to go on summer vacation and all of a sudden the pop-up ads on Google or Instagram or your search bar all start to just kind of come right up in front of you. Or we could be discussing the fact that we need to buy the kids a certain pair of shoes. Maybe one of our kids needs a particular type of shoe. And next thing you know, all of a sudden that specific shoe ad pops up on your phone. Or you, you, you mean, you, you know, you, you, you have an email, you have text messaging, you have maps that Google ultimately kind of owns it all. It has our maps, our calendars. I mean, Google knows where you are going to be and when you're going to be there and what restaurants or shops are next door inviting you. They're bidding you. They're enticing you to come in by these banners that just pop up on your phone. Anybody else kind of getting weirded out by... Uh, all of the, all of the um, AI that's out there. Google isn't really omnipresent. It just feels like it is. But do you know who is omnipresent? God is. God is truly omnipresent. As David wrote in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God is omnipresent and he does see it all. In Hebrews 4.13, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God is everywhere and he knows everything. And there's no privacy with God. He knows your thoughts and he knows your words and he knows your actions. And there's no filter that can keep him away or no password that can prevent him from seeing what you're seeing. And there's no locked door that can keep him out. He can come into your house and he can look into your heart anytime he wants. In fact, he's already there. You can't hide anything from God. I remember my college pastor, some of you know, Rick Holland, used to tell a story about a couple in his ministry who were leaders in the ministry, but one day they came in to have a special meeting with him, and they confessed their sin to him of, hey, Rick, we need to just be honest with you. We've been sexually immoral. And Rick looked at this couple, and he asked them, he's like, well, when when did this happen? And they told him a little bit about when this had happened, and he asked, well, where, where did this happen? They mentioned a few of the details about what was going on, and then Rick looked at them, and he said, I don't know how to tell you guys this, but somebody saw you. At that moment, they were both embarrassed, blushing. They were afraid, and one of the two people said, was it, was it my roommate? And he said, no, it wasn't your roommate. And the girl said, well, was it this, so and, this such and such friend of mine, a close friend of hers? And she, he said, no, it wasn't your friend. And they said, well, who saw us? And he said, God saw you. And in that moment, there was a sigh of relief where they both went, you scared us for a moment there. But the moral of the story is God saw you. And that should make us stop and think about what's going on in our life because God is omnipresent and he sees it all. And here in this passage, the next blank in your outline says the wickedness of man. God is omnipresent in what he saw in that Uh, verse 5, was that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The word for wickedness means bad or evil. God saw, this verse is saying, the wickedness of man and how great it was on the earth. This isn't just man made a mistake or mankind as a whole isn't perfect, but this means every single man had committed very great and horrible sins against God. 
And up to this point in Genesis, in chapter 3, Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden by eating of the fruit that God had told them not to. And in Genesis 4, Cain got jealous, so he killed his brother Abel. In the beginning of this very chapter, chapter 6, there's a sexual sin of astronomical proportions that have been committed in these first four verses. A little bit past our text in Genesis 6, verse 12, it says, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And to some degree, that's true of all of us here this morning. Romans 3, 10 through 12 further describes the extent of men's wickedness, where it says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless, No one does good, not even one. And you say, well, nobody's perfect. Maybe this sin is just a result of the evil world that we live in. And I mean, there's a lot of bad people and bad influences out there. Well, yeah, that's true. But David said it this way in Psalm 51, verse 5. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. He was just being reminded of the fact that it was his fault for his own sin. This is what theologians call the depravity of man. We are born into sin and we have a sinful nature from day one. And our sinful nature doesn't just fall into sin. Our sinful nature pursues sin. And our sinful nature desires sin and the deadly pleasure that it brings. Our sinful nature delights in sin and in false satisfaction. For that's all that sin can truly provide. Not only this, but at the end of this verse, verse 5, your next blank says the pervasiveness of sin. The pervasiveness of sin where you see again that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Just a reminder that sin is everywhere. This sin is not just outside of you, but this sin is inside of you. You see, the things outside of, the problems that are going on in your life that are outside of you could theoretically, circumstantially be changed. You you could make more money with a better job. You may be able to get healthier with the appropriate diet medication, and other treatments. You could find some form of happiness in having better relationships with those around you. But what about the sin that is deep within? And what about this terminal cancer in your soul? And what about this gangrene eating away at the core of who you are? That can't be treated by some type of external material substance. Your heart is so wicked that that's going to take the jumper cables of the Holy Spirit. That's going to take a 360 joule shock of divine electricity. Job 14, 4 says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? There is not one. There there is no cleansing agent. There is no amount of detergent or Clorox that can purify the soul. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, and all of these Horrible sins come out of the heart. They come from inside of you. And your thoughts and your words and your actions, James 1, 14 through 15 says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And this is not the world This is not the bad guys out there. This is evil within you. Romans 3.23 couldn't be more clear. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so all of us here in this room this morning have fallen short. 
We have been weighed on the scales of the righteousness of God and we've been found wanting. All we like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. This is what's happening in the first century and this is what's happening in reality in our life today. I say the first century, I meant to say a creation. We're here in Genesis 6. And so let's move on to our second point this morning, that God grieves. Not only does God see, but God grieves. And your next blank says the immutability of God. The immutability of God. I'm reading from verse 6 now where it says, And the Lord regretted that he made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Now, I say the immutability of God because I want to make sure that we understand an attribute of God and that we're not confused by this verse. So the immutability of God is an important theological term describing an attribute of God that's describing his unchangeableness, that he's unchangeable or immutable. For example, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God affirms, for I, the Lord, do not change. James 1, 17 also teaches the immutability of God when that verse says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. That verse, James 1, 17, is talking about how God is perfect and he gives perfect gifts, and he's the father of lights in whom there is no variation, no variableness, no shadow of turning. This is referring to our human perspective of the sun. The sun, as powerful as it is, can be eclipsed. The sun casts its shadow. The sun rises and sets. It appears and it disappears every single day. It comes out of one tropic and it enters into another, and this causes certain seasons of the year. But with God, there is no change. There are no shadows, and there is no disappearing. God is unchangeable in his nature, his perfections, his purposes, his promises, and his gifts. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. God is immutable and unchangeable because he is perfect and holy. He is steadfast and immovable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if the Bible teaches these things are true, the immutability of God, then what does verse 6 mean when it says that the Lord regretted that he made man on earth? Well, I believe that this is simply pointing to your next blank. I think this is pointing to the sorrow of God the sorrow of God. In fact, the word regretted means that God experienced sorrow. It means that he was moved to pity. It means, one of the definitions of the BDB lexicon says that a definition here could be seen as, quote, to ease oneself by taking vengeance. This is describing God's sorrow as so deep that he is so stirred up about the evil in the world that he decides to do something about it. He was sorry about what? Well, he says that he was sorry that he made man on earth, and specifically that man had rejected him and had embraced his own sin instead, and this grieved God to the heart. Now, obviously, God is spirit, and not man. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, now the Lord is the spirit. So Genesis 6, 6 is not trying to teach that God has a body. It is simply teaching that God has divine emotions, which are always expressed in ways consistent with his holy character. And so we need to think for just a moment this morning about the fact that God grieves. Our sin in some way affects God's heart. God experiences holy anger, and God experiences compassion, love, hate, jealousy, joy, and wrath. 
And to deny God, that he, the fact that God has emotions is to deny that he possesses personality. And though God is transcendent, we've come to know him as a personal living God who engages intimately with his creation, that he loves us in ways that we cannot fathom, and he is immeasurably pained by our sin and our rebellion against him. And one of the problems is that we think that somehow our sin doesn't affect God. We know God to be so big and he's so strong and he's so mighty that somehow our sin doesn't really affect God. And that would be a lie. It would be a lie to believe that your sin doesn't really bother God at all. Imagine for a moment that I invite you over to watch a game at my house. And let's say that we're going to watch my favorite football team, which happens to be the Georgia Bulldogs. And uh, your team is playing my team. And let's say that uh, my team uh, beats your team really bad, which is probably what would happen. Okay. <laughs> And so you're gracious and you allow me to enjoy that big win there in the middle of the season. And then a little bit later in the season, we're going to play again. Those same two teams are facing off in the playoffs. And you invite me to come over to your house to, to watch this second football game between these same two teams. And this would be your inferior team playing my superior team. And somehow, some way, your team comes up with the win and they beat my team and we're now out for the season. And let's say in response to this, I lose it. I get sinfully angry, and so I grab the remote control off the coffee table, and I throw it at your TV, and it shatters. And then I grab the stool that I was sitting on, and I throw that through your TV, and your TV now falls on the floor. And then I walk up to your TV box, and I pull it out of the wall, and I start gnawing on the cables because I've truly gone rage monster here. Okay, I'm super upset about all of this, and I finally calm down, and I say, all right, I've got to go. Thanks for inviting me over. <laughs> and you say, well, wait a minute. What's going on? And I say, well, I didn't hurt you. And you say, yeah, but I bought that TV. That's my TV. That TV serves a purpose. You've ruined that TV. You would be hurt at the fact that I would do that to you as a friend, and you would be grieving the fact that I wrecked that which was serving its purpose. Well, God grieves every time we sin. He cares for us and our well-being, and he knows that sin, all sin destroys us as well as all of the things around us, and we are his, and when we sin, we are seeking to destroy God's property. God takes our sin personal. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God sees our sin God grieves over our sin. And then let's look at verse seven, number three in your outline, God judges. God judges. Your next blank says, God has the right to judge as the creator. He has the right to judge as the creator. Verse seven, so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. This verse is telling us two things, and the first is, is that God has the right to judge as creator God. In Genesis 1, God didn't just create the world, he created the universe. And there is nothing that exists materially outside of God's grand creation. And we live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a huge collection of stars and dust and gas. And it's called a spiral galaxy because if you could view it from top to bottom, it would look like a, a spinning pinwheel. And the sun is located on one of those spiral arms about 25,000 light years away from the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. 
And it's estimated that there are between 100 and 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And God created it all. And on day six of creation, God created man. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God created us to have a relationship with him, to know him, and to grow in the likeness of God in his communicable attributes like his love and his mercy and his grace and his kindness and his compassion. And so when Genesis 6, 7 says that man was created from the face of the land, that is referring to creation language back from Genesis 2, verse 7, when it says, then the Lord formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. On day six of creation, not only was man created, but God also created the animals and the creeping things and the birds of the heavens. All of this language from Genesis 6, verse 7, again, it's reminding us from Genesis 1 that God is the creator. We did not evolve. There is no big bang. You are not an accident. We didn't just happen to get here by chance. We weren't formed on the back of crystals. There were no alien powers that somehow planted us here. We, as men and women, are created by God in his image to have a relationship with him and to grow and to flourish as human beings. And because God is the creator, he has the right to do with his creation whatever he wants. As you heard just a few weeks ago when I was out and we had Matthew Johnston preach from Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. God is the creator of all. And if he is the creator of all, and he is, and if God owns it all, and he does, then he can do with the world whatever he wants. He is the potter and we are the clay. And he has every right to do with us as he sees fit. Now, not only does God have the right to judge as creator, but your next blank says he has the responsibility to judge as a righteous judge. It's his right and it is his responsibility. If God doesn't judge the sin of man, then he is not a righteous judge. A righteous judge must do what is right and just in his domain. And if there is sin and evil and wickedness, then this righteous judge must judge in accordance with his perfect standard. And if God doesn't judge evil when he is, uh, when he is judging, then he's not doing his job. And he's no longer a good, holy God who can be trusted. So God is acting in accordance with his righteous character when he blots out or wipes out sinful mankind. Psalm 711 says God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Job 8.3, does God pervert justice or does the Almighty pervert the right? And so God judged the world by sending the flood. And he will judge it yet again, as we see in Acts 17, 31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. But at this point in Genesis 6, God chose to judge the world by sending a flood. And it says in Genesis 6, 13, skip down to verse 13, and God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Look down at verse 17, again of Genesis 6, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall die. This is the judgment that the world deserved for their sin. 
And this is the judgment that you and I deserve for our sin. Romans 3.23 again, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of our sin is death. But thank God that he delivers. God sees, God grieves, God judges, and now we see in verse eight, number four in your outline, God delivers. That next blank says, God bestowed favor upon Noah by faith. He bestowed favor on Noah by faith, verse eight, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this verse is not hinting at the thought that somehow Noah found favor by his own effort or by his own merit. No, every, every one finds favor from God uh, only by his grace. Right? No one finds favor based on their own good works. Favor from God, which is the same thing as grace from God, is only received by faith. And that's why the writer of Hebrews makes that abundantly clear in the hall of faith of Hebrews 11, verse 7. It says, Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So Hebrews 11, seven is saying that Noah had no value in himself that caused God to save him, but rather Noah was a man who had faith in God. And because of that faith that he had in God, God chose to deliver Noah from the flood of his wrath. Back to Genesis 6 and verse 9, it does say that Noah was a righteous man. And it does say that he was blameless in his generation and that he walked with God. But all of those characteristics of Noah are given to him through repentance and faith. And then we see, your next blank, that God instructed Noah to build an ark. God instructed Noah to build an ark. As you remember from the rest of Genesis chapter 6, that God gave very specific instructions on exactly how to build the ark. God told Noah about the length and the breadth and the height of the ark, and he told him what kind of wood to use and how to apply the pitch. And God told Noah to bring two of every kind of animal into the ark. And God told Noah to get into the ark along with his wife and his three sons and their wives. And so there were a total of eight people in the ark. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 7, Genesis 7 verses 11 and 12, it says, on that day, so they've been warning them about the coming flood, and that's why Noah built the ark. And then it says in Genesis 7, 11, on that day, all the fountains of the deep, of the great deep, burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And you know the story. The, the worldwide flood lasted for about a year. And at the end of the flood, Noah released some birds who flew around and some came back because they couldn't find a place to land. And then one day a bird came back with a freshly plucked olive leaf. And at that time, Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. God delivered Noah and his family through the ark. And then our last blank says, God provides an ark of salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He provides an ark of salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Moses and his family boarded the ark before the flood, Genesis 7, 16 says, and those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. Genesis 7, 16, the Lord shut him in as he went in to the ark as God had commanded him. Now listen, the ark is a true story. I believe that it happened exactly like the Bible said that it happened. 
But I also know that this story of God rescuing Noah from the flood points to God rescuing every sinner from their sins through the cross. And the reason I know that is because it's exactly what the Bible teaches. So turn with me, if you will. I'm asking you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 so that you can see this amazing passage with your own eyes. It's already clear enough, I believe, from Genesis 6, but certainly when you have a New Testament apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit connecting these dots clearly for us, then we are on a solid foundation. And not only are we on a solid foundation, we must see the ark not only as a true story, but also as a picture of our salvation. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This verse, verse 18, is saying that Jesus was perfectly righteous and that he died for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us because in verse 18, we would be considered as those who are unrighteous. And so it was through his sacrifice, this one-time sacrifice. The best priest would have to make sacrifice year after year, but Jesus on his one occasion, when he died on the cross, through his one sacrifice, he brings us to God. And on the cross, verse 18 is saying that he was put to death in the flesh. And yet we know that he was alive in the spirit. This means that his body died but that his spirit lives on. And it was in his spirit, verse 19 says, that it was in his spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So First Peter is saying between Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection, Jesus proclaimed victory to a certain set, you could say a subset, of demonic spirits who were in prison. And so who were these demons or these demonic spirits in prison in verse 19? Well, look at verse 20. Because they, the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So this verse, verse 20, is saying that these demons from verse 19 that are in prison were the Nephilim, who in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, inhabited men and committed indecent, sinful, sexual acts with the daughters of man. And so it was at this point that God decided that he was going to do something about it. And even though there were 120 years of Noah preaching while the ark was being built, it had no effect on the wickedness of the hearts of the human race, other than the eight persons who were brought safely through. And so the Lord decided to blot out all of the wicked mankind in the flood. Then in verse 21, Peter writes, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in this verse, verse 21, Peter is saying that baptism corresponds to this story of God safely bringing eight persons through the floodwaters. And in this verse, Peter is not talking about the water of baptism for the believer, for he says there in that verse, I'm not talking about essentially the removal of dirt from the body. He says, I'm not talking about water baptism here. I'm talking about a spiritual baptism into Christ. 
And I'm talking about that spiritual baptism is defined by what he says there in verse 21 as an appeal to God for a good conscience. That, that, that the sinner is repenting and asking God to cleanse the sinner of their sin by the cross. This is a reference to repentance and faith. Your soul is not saved by water baptism, but your soul is saved by repenting and believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're baptized into Christ with a spiritual baptism that you're now in him and he is in you. And so the big picture here is that just as Noah was one of these eight people who was brought into the ark and survived God's judgment on mankind, so can your experience be this morning by being saved by Christ. The cross of Christ is the ark of your salvation. You must be immersed into Christ who is your ark of safety from God's coming judgment. The cross of Christ is your only way out. There were no other ships being built in Genesis 6. There's one ark, and they got into that one ark, and the cross of Christ is your only way out. The resurrection of Christ demonstrates God's acceptance of Christ's substitutionary death for those who believe. And just as Noah got into the ark and was saved by faith, you must come to the cross and be saved by faith as well. The judgment of God fell on Christ just as the judgment of the flood water fell on the ark. Only the person who is in Christ, who is our ark of safety will be spared. Only in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross will you be able to sail over the waters of God's judgment into eternal glory. In order to be delivered this morning from the wrath of God upon the sin that is within you, you must get into the wrath of God, the ark of safety, By coming to Christ by faith, you must believe in Christ's perfect life and in his death and in his resurrection in order to be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Won't you come to him today? You see, God takes your sin and my sin personal. And that's why he sent a person, his one and only son, a son, to take our sin upon himself when he was nailed to the tree, right? Today, we celebrate the fact that on the third day that God raised Jesus from the dead to demonstrate ultimate victory over death, hell, and the grave. Why? Because he is Risen. First Peter 3 talks about it must be the resurrection of Christ. And so let me this morning invite you to come to Christ today. And he will by no means cast you out. The door is open for you to come. But who knows how long it will be before the Lord shuts the door and brings the flood of his wrath upon all mankind. I'm pleading with you like Noah who pled for 120 years to his generation, get into the ark. God's provided safety in the ark. And I'm begging you on this very day to come to Christ, to come and see his cross and come believe in his resurrection. That today you would know that God sees, that God grieves, that God judges, and that God delivers the take-home section of your outline this morning, would you acknowledge today that your sin grieves the heart of God? 
If you're just going to be honest this morning, a lot of us don't grieve anymore over our sin. And this morning, we desperately needed to be reminded that God grieves over our sin each and every time that we have an evil thought or say an evil word or do an evil act that God grieves over our sin. Do you understand the second blank there, the seriousness of the future coming of the judgment of God? Just like the days of Noah, people were mocking Noah, paying no attention to Noah. It was 100 plus years before anything ever happened that each generation since then has, in a sense, done the same thing, laughing and mocking at the preacher who would say that there's the coming gloom and doom we're made fun of by caricatures of people preaching the gospel at open air, of like, oh, they're always preaching about the wrath of God and sin. It is real, and it is coming. And it is our objective this morning to say to you, your last point there, is there any reason what's keeping you from getting into the ark of salvation through the cross of Christ today? What is that that would be preventing you from coming into the ark of salvation through the cross of Christ today. And if that's where you're at in your heart and your life this morning, we'll have a few people standing right over here by this door at the end of our service. We invite you to come. And we invite you to come into the ark of salvation provided by Christ and Christ alone. Don't leave this morning until you understand that God delivers through faith in the gospel because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to see <clears throat> from Genesis 6. <coughs> <coughs> thank you for the opportunity to see just a, a clarity of your presence on earth and of how you <clears throat> deal with sin and how you provide a way out through the cross of Christ. And I pray that this morning, whether there be visitors or regular attenders or members, whether we be young or old this morning, we would realize the reality of the fact that we're doomed apart from the grace of God, that you would show your favor on this very day to those who would need to repent and believe. God, for those of us who are saved, we're so forever grateful for the cross of Christ, which is our ark of salvation. And we pray for that timid soul this morning who's being tormented by their own guilt and shame, by their conscience, that this morning that you would provide safety and security and peace, which comes only through repentance and faith and belief. That we would know that the, the floodwaters of your wrath are, are coming, not in the form of water, but in the future you say it'll be a fire. So we pray, God, that the reality of that truth would cause us today to examine our hearts and our lives and to know that while you see and you grieve and you judge, that you also deliver and you deliver through your son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Pray that you would do a special work of grace today in our hearts in a way that would cause us to be forever thankful for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray, amen. Amen. Church family, let's stand together one more time this morning, lifting our voices, singing praise to our Lord, singing crown him with many crowns. <laughs> Crown him with many crowns, 
Lord Jesus, what more could be done than thou hast done? Thy death is my life, thy resurrection my peace, thy ascension my hope, thy prayers my comfort. And you're dismissed.